Hello, my name is Wilma Kennedy. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. Today I'm interviewing Mr. Fred Geraci, and it's Thursday, August 31st, 2006, and we're at the Anderson Branch Library. Our camera operator today is Michael Alfieri. And first of all, we'd like to thank you, Mr. Geraci, for giving us the opportunity to listen to your story. Well, I'm glad you wanted to listen to the story. I'm very, very pleased. Well, where would you like to begin? How about where you were born? Uh, I was born uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been in Cincinnati all my life. Uh, I was born in 1924, which makes me 82 years old. Uh, I was born in Hyde Park and uh, went to St. Mary's grade school and on to Purcell. And uh, from there, uh, started out at Xavier University and I was in, involved in the uh, Reserve Officers Training Program. And in that very first year, that would be 1943, uh, uh, being enlisted in the Reserve Training Program, I was called to active duty in, uh, in May, ironically May 26th, the day before my birthday. And this is 1943. Uh, so, uh, being called up, I, I was, uh, I gathered at Hyde Park Square with a group of about 25 or 30 men uh, who had been drafted, and we got on a bus, and from that point we crossed the river over into Fort Thomas, Kentucky, which was more or less a, you might call a staging area or an area where the, where the uh, men that were going into the service were going to have their physicals and so on. Uh, so I did go over there to Fort Thomas and uh, pass the physical. And, uh, and then from there I was sent on to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Uh, uh, I was there in, at Camp Wheeler from May till about October, I guess. Uh, for what they call the old basic training, meaning uh, a lot of walking, a lot of hiking. But uh, as I look back on those days of basic training, uh, they paid off for me because uh, the uh, physical fitness program that they put us through, mm -hmm. uh, it really showed up uh, in my combat days that followed. And so it was in an October of 43, that uh, I got on a ship from Newport News, Virginia, and uh, we were told that we were going to North Africa. Uh, this is a time when the war had been in, going into the third year, the war, see, Pearl Harbor 41, so this is 1943, the fall of 43, and we got on the troop ship, troop ship with about oh, 3,000, maybe a few more than that, to Tunisia in Africa. Uh, we were told by the naval people on board ship, uh, the trip was gonna take about six or seven days at the most to get there. And uh, much to our surprise, uh, it took us 28 days to oh get there. My. And during that whole time, um, we, were, we were always told to stay below. We could never go topside. And the seas were rough. It was hurricane season, and we were dodging hurricanes. And I tell you, every every man on the ship was so sick that you just wouldn't believe. And uh, there is a humorous part of it. Uh, we made a big joke out of it. And but deep inside, I mean, all of us, every single one of the men, were, were just about as sick as you could possibly be because of the rough seas. And, uh, and then just two or three days outside of Africa, we had to start to worry about the German aircraft that was uh, hoping to blow us out of the water. So between dodging the, the German airplanes, the German fighter planes, bombers, and, and the hurricanes, uh, it was a pretty rough go getting over to uh, Tunisia. Uh, we finally got there, and this was my first Christmas away from home. Because uh, uh, December of 43, yeah, that's my first Christmas away from home. And uh, in Tunisia, uh, 
it was a huge staging area because the war at that time was being fought in Sicily and then in, in the southern part and central part of Italy. So we were just, uh, just hanging on, waiting to be called to see just which unit we might be assigned to. So my first Christmas and my first New Year's away from home, I was 18 then, uh, that was my first experience away from home uh, being uh, in Africa. And then uh, just shortly before January 22nd, maybe a few days, maybe a week, uh, we got on the ship again and uh, we were sent to Naples in Italy. Uh, bear in mind that all the fighting against the Germans at that time was in the mountains of central Italy. and. Uh, what was going to happen, we had no idea that it was going to happen at the time, but the higher, higher ups, the, uh, the big shots, they were going to make an end run and establish a beachhead at Anzio. And so it was on January 22nd, this is now 1944, uh, that uh, I climbed over the side of a troop ship. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the what they call rope ladders that are hanging yes, over the side yes, of a ship. So I'm climbing over the side with a full field pack and a rifle and had no idea how to swim. I, oh. I, was, I was petrified, scared to death, and uh, climbing off the side of the ship we uh, went into these small boats, I forget what you call landing craft, I believe they're called, mm -hmm. they'll hold about maybe I'm afraid to guess, 75, maybe 100 men. And we went ashore to Anzio, which is just about 30 miles south of Rome, for some people that uh, are not up on, on the beachhead of Anzio. Uh, and so we made our landing there. I believe the first wave went in around 2 a.m. And I was the second wave that went in, and that was about 6 in the morning. Uh, and luckily, we caught the Germans by surprise. They had no idea that we were coming in on an end around landing at Anzio. And so for the first two days, it was, it was a piece of cake. There was hardly any resistance at all. Uh, we could have walked miles and miles and miles and we met hardly any resistance. But we couldn't go, we couldn't move too quickly though because we, we had to wait for supplies to catch up with us, and we had to realize too that once the Germans did know that we were there, uh, they were going to bomb the heck out of the out of the out of the port uh, where, where where the supplies might be coming in. So that's the beginning of the Anzio story. Uh, uh, most people know that we were there Anzio January until May, and for those five months. It was uh, it was just a horrible situation. Uh, in April of '44, I believe April 18th is when the uh, German army really gathered forces together, and they sent se they sent seven divisions to try to uh, kick us back out into the ocean again, into the sea, and that was seven division divisions against our three. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we, we held off at that point. This is April 18th to the 26th. Those are a few days that will remain in my mind for, for, for as long as I live. Uh, I'd like to point out just briefly, you may notice the name Anzio on my cap. And the reason uh, I, I like to wear this cap and I, I don't wear it too often because I, I feel bad about it because an incident took place about five years ago. Uh, Tom Brokaw, the NBC anchorman, mm -hmm. uh, was, had this tremendous crusade for the veterans to tell their story. He, he, he just wanted us to come out and tell our story. So uh, to make a long story short, I go into a gas station. At that time I had good eyesight. <laughs> And uh, I pay the cashier and, and the, the young fellow, he must have been about 26, 27 years old, a nice looking fellow, seemed very educated, talking to him. 
and he looked at my cap and he said, Anzio, is that a new pizza parlor in town? And uh, when he said that, I, I really wanted to jump over the counter and punch him in the nose. I really wanted to. It took everything in my body to keep from saying something. Uh, so I paid the bill and I went out to the car and I told my wife, Betty, I said, uh, do you know what that man just said to me? And I told Betty what had happened. And from that point on, I said, you know, Tom Brokaw is right. People have to know our story. Here's, a, here's a man that was about 25 or 30 years old and had no idea of the word Anzio. And uh, to say the least, it made me very upset. And so from that point on, like I mentioned to my wife, I said, you know, I haven't talked about the war for 50 years, not one mention. I said, maybe, we, maybe it's time the grandchildren and the children, maybe Tom Brokaw is right about our being the greatest generation. And so from that point on, you know, I began to open up to the kids and tell them story after story about what had happened to me. And uh, so that's the story about Anzio. Of course, a lot of things happened at Anzio. I could go on for hours. Uh, I remember one time we had, uh, uh, had gone back to a rest area. Uh, it was called the Pines. Uh, we were back there for maybe two or three days. Uh, and while we were there, the chaplain held a mass for for anyone who wanted to attend, and, and the jeep, the hood of this jeep was was the altar, and uh, halfway through the mass, in in came the uh, German artillery, and you talk about guys scattering. It was it was just a terrible situation. To this day, I can't remember whether Father finished saying mass or not, but uh, it gives you an idea of the uh, danger at, at Anzio. No matter where you were, I mean, you were always in danger of being shelled. I mean, I was in the hospital at MASH, at, in one of the MASH units for two or three days, and the doctors and nurses, I mean, they were, they were just as fra afraid as, as guys that were up on the front lines because uh, the Germans, uh, they had no regard for the hospitals, and, and, and it, it was just a terrible situation. Uh, and so finally, after five, I think I'm talking about this too much, Finally, after five months, we did break through, and uh, we did uh, conquer Rome. And just two things briefly about Anzio before I get off of that. We had something known as the Battle of the Caves. Uh, I had been assigned to E Company, uh, re remembering that I was in an inf infantry division, 45th Division. and. Uh, during that time of April 18th, I believe I mentioned to the 26th, was something I'll never forget. Uh, funny thing happened while, while going to E Company on an assignment. I was surrounded by the Germans, and I was surrounded for six days. And uh, being with E Company, my, my I was with Headquarters Company, but I was on assignment then to E Company. And uh, something I'll never forget there, E Company had 200 men at that particular date that I'm referring to. There were 200 men in, in E Company. And uh, when I got back to headquarters, uh, I found out that only eight of us survived out of the 200. Oh my. And, and I was one of the eight lucky ones that, uh, that survived that. Uh, and during that period of April 16th to 26th, I believe, uh, our battalion had 800 men and during that time of being surrounded, uh, our battalion of 800 men, uh, just in those, just in that short period of time, 800 men, uh, 600 were killed, 100 were wounded, and 100 of us got out alive. And, uh, and I mentioned briefly, I used the word caves. Yes. Uh, this was the hillside uh, on Anzio, at the, on the beachhead, about maybe two, two miles inland. It was the only place we could go to take cover because we were totally surrounded, so we went in these caves, and we were there for a couple days without any food or water. 
And uh, finally, the, uh, the officers in charge decided that uh, we couldn't hold out any longer, and we only had one option left. And there was a road that passed right by the front of one of the entrances to the caves. And he said, uh, we're going to have to make a break for it. And the only thing we could do is to call for our own friendly fire to hit this road that is going by the caves. And at a certain time, as soon as that fire begins, we are going to start running and going uh, into the ditch off the side of the road and crawl as fast as we can crawl and try to get out because there was no other way to, of, of, of saving our lives. So this is what we did. Uh, the road was about mm, two, three hundred yards, maybe not quite that far, maybe two hundred yards long. And so uh, there was a group of about twenty of us that did make a break for it in spite of the incoming artillery, friendly fire. And, and we crawled in a ditch. I can remember that so clearly. And, uh, and we did make it to the end of the road. The Germans were on this side of the road and we were on the other side of the road. And artillery fire was so intense that, that we had the Germans pinned down really good. And uh, we were pinned down also, but we kept moving. And, and it, it, was, uh, it was that one situation that, uh, that that just scared the heck out of me for the, something I'll never forget. In fact, I wrote a little log uh, a few years ago. I called it the Miracle of 44. And it, in there, it, it has a picture of the road that we used uh, to, to, to try to, to, to break away, uh, to get out of the caves. Uh, and uh, successfully, uh, yeah, we made it. And. Uh, and we, uh, a few uh, men stayed back. Uh, some of the uh, uh, aides that were there, the medics, that's the word I was trying to think of. Some of the medics stayed back, some of the doctors stayed back. And I found out years later in reading a book called The Rock of Anzio, which is a book about the 45th Division. And it, it, I found out in that book about uh, some of the men that stayed back that uh, were held prisoners and, and, and how many of them were killed just two or three hours later after we had uh, uh, broken out of the caves. So the decision by the, by the officers to make a break for it uh, saved my life. If I had stayed behind, I mean, I wouldn't be talking to you here today. So, so, so we eventually we, we conquered Rome and uh, I think the, gen the generals and the higher-ups decided that we needed a rest from January to May, so we were in a rest area after we conquered Rome until August. And then in August we went into southern France. We were in the invasion of southern France. This was in August. And I absolutely will not forget to mention that in June, while we were in, in the rest area, this is when we have the June the 6th, the Omaha Beach, yes. the Battle of the Bulge. Yes. How fortunate I was that in August, when we did get back into combat, uh, instead of me landing in France in the Battle of the Bulge and so on, I landed in southern France. And it was an identical situation as Anzio. No opposition whatsoever at all. None whatsoever. It was the element of surprise? Please. The element of surprise? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. And, uh, and because most of the German forces were in the northern part of France, mm -hmm. they had their hands full up there. But, uh, but uh, France was a piece of cake compared to what we had gone through at Anzio. Because at Anzio, for one thing, we didn't have proper equipment. Uh, clothing for the winter. Now, we, we, we froze our tails off at, uh, on Anzio because we just didn't have the proper equipment. I, don't, I can't tell you the number of people that uh, had frostbite and, and had to go back to the rear 
and go back to the hospitals because of not being able to, to tolerate the cold. I mean, it, it was just awful. And so we moved through th southern France. Uh, Saint Maxime was one of the towns that, uh, one of the beaches that we landed on. And so we moved real, real, real fast. We moved pretty quickly through France. Uh, Aschaffenburg was one of our big battles. Uh, and then we went into uh, Nuremberg. We kept moving north into France and then start moving to the east into Germany. So from Nuremberg, uh, we came to uh, the crossing of the Danube. And it was there uh, where we met some really stiff opposition. Uh, we hadn't counted on it. We thought the German army was a defeated army. We thought they were done. But evidently they had blown a whole bunch of their bridges that we couldn't cross, but they forgot some of their own men were still on the other side of the, of the river. And so those men that were still on this other side of the river where we were, uh, they gave us a pretty hard time. And, uh, but we eventually, the Corps of Engineers did a tremendous job building pontoons and so on to get us across the Danube. And so we had orders then from the Danube to go right into Munich. And just like that, orders changed, and, and we were told, no, you're not going to go into Munich. You're going to go head, you're going to head south and go into Dachau. And uh, all of us looked at each other, Dachau, what's Dachau? Because at ANCO and, and so on, we hadn't had the privilege, or I shouldn't say privilege, but we were not aware of what was happening at Dachau okay. as, as Auschwitz and so on. When yes. you're in the service, people back in the States were probably reading more about that than, than we were. So, yeah, we're, we're going to Dachau. And uh, in my book, I listed my ten most memorable moments. And uh, Dachau had to be number one. Uh, we were the first unit that to get into the camp. Uh, fortunately, just about all of the German soldiers had gone. They had fled. And what we saw there was just horrible, horrible disease. Uh, incidentally, there were 32,000 interns in, at Dachau when we went into the camp. 32,000. And we were talking, so it's a pretty big camp. And we were talking to some of the prisoners that were able to speak English. And they said, no, they hadn't had food for days, you know, when the Germans pulled out. And, uh, and they told us such horrible stories. Uh, I remember one incident. Uh, we walked into the, in the front gate at the camp, and this large, huge compound, a uh, uh, few of the prisoners that were able to walk, and, and I mean barely walk, because. Uh, one of them, well, there were a few German guards with their hands held high over in one section of the yard, and uh, and these few prisoners, ironically, most of them were not Jewish. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of Holocaust, they out of the word they think of right away is is, is the Jewish people, and uh, true, six six million were killed in the Holocaust. But there were also a few million nationals, that is people that were against uh, Hitler and were not Jewish people. And, uh, and so we talked to some of those people, prisoners, they could barely open their mouth, they were so weak and they were just as thin as a rail. And the one prisoner came up to one of my buddies standing next to me and he tried to grab his gun from him because he wanted to shoot the uh, German guard that, that was still over there. And they had been through so many horrible tests. Uh, you can't believe the different medical tests that they were put through and, and then uh, led to, to, to die. And one more thing about Dachau. Uh, far off in the distance, we could see freight cars and, and a, a, a f about 40 to 45 freight cars had come into the compound. I, and I, and one, at that time I was staff sergeant and one of my men asked if, I could, if, if he could uh, 
go down and count the, the freight cars. And I, I didn't mention yet that the freight cars were filled to the top with dead bodies. Oh my. Because they had been sent, they, the German kept moving the prisoners from one concentration camp to another. And at that particular time, April 28th, the date I'll never forget, uh, probably the freight car had been there maybe four or five days, and each car was just filled to the top with uh, with uh, prisoners. And uh, and my buddy went down, and I said, go ahead and see how many freight cars are there. And he did go down, and he counted 41. So 41 freight cars just filled to the top with, with that. And there were a few still alive on the ground, I recall, and uh, one of my lieutenants was mentioning that they had, they were barely alive, and they did try to get out of the freight cars, and they they, they were crawling on the ground trying to get out, but most of them didn't make it. They had died, they they couldn't make it, and so we were told to move on then from from Dachau and uh, move on to Munich, which was just a short distance, not too far away. I can't remember, maybe 15, 20 miles maybe a little further. So we did go on into Munich, and at that point, the end of World War II in Europe. And uh, most of the guys, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell, at least in my unit, it, it was hard to tell that the war was ended because they're just, we were just thankful and happy that we were the lucky ones that made it. Uh, it, it if anybody did create a ruckus of any kind and, and, and a lot of whoopla and all that kind of stuff, you could bet that they were a rookie, that they, they had only been in, uh, in combat a very short time. But for those of us that had been there from Anzio on, uh, we just, we just uh, thank God that we were the lucky ones and that uh, we were remembering the towns that we had gone through in France, Grenoble, Bundenthal, Engweiler, Aschaffenburg, which I mentioned before, which was a horrible, horrible disaster. And so we were recalling those instances. Instead of celebrating, we were we were recalling those things, and we were grateful that that we were the lucky ones that made it. And uh, and this is May 8th, I believe, 8th or 9th. I think it's the 8th when the war did end and we were in Munich. And ironically, I had to stay there from uh, May the 8th until October because uh, I had to stay to more or less po as a police unit to, to, to keep law and order and to, because the German people were just petrified. They had, they, had, they had been fed so much propaganda about how nasty we are and, uh, and, and for some reason, my unit, we stayed there all the way from May until October. And it was finally in October that, uh, that I got my orders uh, to come home. So I was overseas uh, two years, four months, and 17 days. And I finally did land back again at Newport News, uh, Virginia. And I was on a train. and got off at Camp Atterbury, right here close by in Indiana. And uh, thank God that's where I got my discharge papers and I was reunited with my family. My brother served in, in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, he passed away about four or five years ago and he served in, uh, as I said, in the Pacific. And uh, uh, needless to say, I got a pretty warm welcome I would think. When I got home, uh, I only had a brother, uh, my family, my mom, dad, mom and dad, and I had a brother, Joe. Uh, but my mother, she had a large family. She came from a large family. So I had so many aunts and uncles you wouldn't believe. And uh, they were very loving. Just when I walked in that door, I mean, it, it was just uh, something I'll never forget. So, so that's about it. Uh, were you able to communicate at any time uh, while you were overseas with your family? Uh, not, not in any sense except in writing letters. They, you wrote on these small sheets and they were, I forget what you call them, 
they were mimeographed onto small little pieces of paper, uh -huh. and it was only through that way. Every once in a while, we would I would get a package from home, uh, uh, canned fruit, uh, canned peaches, canned pears, maybe tuna fish, something like that, uh -huh. because uh, we didn't have we didn't have very many hot meals for those two years. I think. Uh, very rare. Uh, let's see, I was in a rest area uh, in Italy at, when we conquered Rome. So that was May, June, July, so those three months. But uh, I don't remember having any kind of rest area or rest at all. Other than that, uh, it was constantly moving on foot. As I said before, I was in the infantry and uh, my feet didn't hurt in the infantry. What hurt was my back. I mean, uh, you can't imagine what it's like to walk day after day with a rifle and a full field pack. I, I still can feel those straps digging into my chest here. <laughs> it was uh, an everlasting it, memory. It, uh, uh, talk about getting a ride. Excuse me. Very rarely did we ever get on a truck to get a ride. Uh, that was unheard of. But I did get a ride once. And this might amuse you, it amuses my, our grandchildren. Uh, after we conquered Rome, a small group of us was uh, invited to have an audience with the Pope. And so there were about 10 or 15 of us on the truck uh, 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 going into Vatican Square. And I happened to be the last one to get off of the truck. And as I'm jumping off the truck, the darn truck backs up and runs right over my foot. And you talk about oh. pain. So they had to send for the medics to take me back to the rest area. And I never did get to see the Pope. Oh. I never did oh. get to see the Pope. So the kids, they got a big kick out of that one. Did, was your foot fractured? Please. Did you break your foot? No, no. I was okay in a couple of days, but in that time, at that time, I mean, my big toe was really a big toe. I mean, How bad? <laughs> But I'll never forget that. That was that was something. So now, when you got back home, did you go back to Xavier? Did you continue with your uh, education? I, I did start my sophomore year at Xavier. I played basketball. I was on the uh, varsity basketball team, and uh, early April, just be, maybe there were about five games left to the season in basketball. Uh, I quit school which is probably one of the biggest mistakes I had ever made in my life. And the reason being I wanted to play professional baseball. And, and so I, I did sign a professional baseball contract with the Boston Braves. In those days they were known as the Boston Braves, now they're the Atlanta Braves. And uh, so I played four years of baseball. Uh, I was married in 46 and uh, that was my first year of professional baseball and my wife Betty, uh, God bless her, I don't know how she could put up with me the way she did and uh, being on the road a lot and being in the minor leagues and so on, was, uh, it, it wasn't much fun and in my fourth year I hurt my arm pretty bad and, and uh, I was making $90 a month, not $90 a week or a day, $90 a month was my pay and so I sat down with Betty and I said, Mom, I said, I think we better go back home. I don't think things are going to work <laughs> out. So uh, we went, we came back home to Cincinnati. Uh, my, my dad, my mom and dad had a grocery store on Hyde Park Square. So uh, uh, I went back to work and, and worked at the store with my mom and dad. So I, I don't know what else you'd want me to say. So have you stayed in Hyde Park? Since? Uh, uh, yes, I, we, did, we did for a while, and then uh, I think in the late 80s, we moved to Mount Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom had uh, gone into a nursing home there, and she wanted us to be close to her, and we were willing to do that, and so we moved to Mount Washington, and we've lived in Mount Washington ever since. Uh, well, you've had an absolutely wonderful, wonderful interpretation of everything that's happened. Thank you so very much for sharing this with us, Mr. Geraci. It's wonderful. And your wife, Betty, for being here with us. And 
it's just a, a wonderfully moving experience. And I think the fact that you want to keep this alive for the future generations, you're doing a great service for history. Well, I think the Anzio cap tells it all. I think it does, too. Uh, and I'm glad that you realize how important your story is. <laughs> well, thank you. And we thank you so very much for serving and for your memories. And um, just wish you all the best and the best of health. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you.